of making the things you say come about. You know, if uh, you got to be careful what you preach and the, the things you say. I began this year with a sermon about reality versus expectation. And, and the, the point of that message was that with God, our expectations often fall short of the reality he has planned of, of what God is actually doing. You know, I can tell you beyond a shadow of a doubt that I did not expect or plan to be leaving Wichita with a fiancé. God's reality has been something much greater. I have met the most wonderful, beautiful, amazing woman I have, have ever come across. You know, and as I began Vicarage, I, I knew that I would learn and grow a lot and that I would, that I would come to this place and I would meet some amazing people. What I could not expect was a reality that God would introduce me to people who are so amazing, so loving, so caring, who have welcomed me into this community, into your hearts and lives and homes. And, and for that, I, I thank you and I consider myself so blessed. I, I only pray and hope that I have been a fraction of the blessing to you guys as you have been to me. So, so thank you. You know, God has this, this amazing way of just working things around. And I'm sure that in your own lives, you've had the same experience where you've expected something, you knew how it was going to turn out, and reality with God turned out to be something so much greater. If you've ever been bold enough to read the whole book of Ezekiel, start to finish, you might go through the same sensations. Because you see, in the first half, it's all law, all judgment, all the time, on the nations, on Israel, on Jerusalem. The little bit of gospel and, and hope sprinkled in there just for good measure. And so as you get to the second half, you, you think, well, we know God brought them back from exile, so I guess that must be in there, but I mean, it seems pretty bleak right now. There can't be much. And then you start to read the second half of Ezekiel, and you, you hear the prophecy of the valley of the dry bones as, as God brings the dead back to life, as God prophesies about a new temple where he will be present, that, where everything will be made right of a new Israel where, where the waters of life flow, where the trees always bloom. You know, it's this perfect heavenly place. The reality that God was going to bring is so far greater than what the Israelites or what even we could have hoped for or expected. And, you know, as you, as you read Ezekiel, you start to see a common theme and, and there's a heart to Ezekiel's message and there's also a heart, I think, that that reiterates God's heart for his people. In Ezekiel 33, this is what he says, As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why should you die, people of Israel? You know, that's, that's the heart of God's message. And, and as we read from the end of Ezekiel chapter 47, is, as God is prophesying about how he's going to restore the people, restore this kingdom and, and make the new heavens and the new earth appear, we realize that God's blessing is, is unwarranted and, and poured out on our hearts and our lives, and, and we don't deserve it any more than the people of Israel did. And in fact, as you look at the people of Israel in the first half, you start to be surprised that, that God would offer any blessings. You know, the people of Israel were chasing after idols. They were sacrificing Children, they, the nations mocked God. They, they ridiculed God's people as they were taken to exile. They condemned them and broke treaties. They did all these kinds of horrible things. And so we think, well, God's pretty just in, in bringing down his punishment. And, and then we reflect on our own lives and we see how, how we fall short of God's glory. We fall short of doing the right thing. How, in the end, we could really only deserve God's punishment. And yet that's not what God offers. He offers his grace. You see, this, this message reminds us that the heart of God is, is that sometimes he lets the children face the consequences, face the music so that they might learn and grow. But his ultimate desire is that they would be called back to him, that they would repent and come back into his kingdom. That's God's heart. That's the reality that is so far greater than our expectation that, that even though we are sinful and broken, God calls us back into his kingdom. See, reality with God is so much greater than our expectation. But as we read prophecies like this from Ezekiel that are about the end times, we need to be careful. Because while we know that all prophecies are fulfilled in Christ, sometimes we're still trying to figure out how that prophecy is going to be fulfilled and, and what it looks like and what's still to expect. But you see, we have a clue for Ezekiel because the apostle John 
has a vision that is very similar to what Ezekiel has had. And, and here are the words of John that, that say almost the same thing as Ezekiel. From Revelation 22, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. See, this is the vision that God has. And, and as we read through Ezekiel, this Old Testament prophecy, you have to wonder, well, what does this mean for you and I as God's people today? What does Ezekiel's message mean for us? Well, I'd like to go through those 12 verses of Ezekiel 47 for you today. And you see, in, in verse 1 and 2, we hear about this stream that, or this trickle of water that comes out of, out of the temple. You know what? So where is it coming from and where, what does that mean? Well, it comes out of the Holy of Holies and it flows past the temple out to the outer court and down into the world and into the city and, and out into the nations. See, this, this might seem odd, but it's the same thing that, that the Apostle John prophesied about. And, and it seems strange until you start to realize what all the other Old Testament prophets started to profess and proclaim. You see, they, they held out this hope for better times for Israel and for Jerusalem that God would restore things and make things right and make things right. And as they looked at the city of Jerusalem, they, they saw one fundamental flaw. See, Jerusalem has no true river. And so they believed that God would remedy, remedy this as he dwelled in the midst of his people. You see, and, and so we hear from prophets in places like Psalm 46. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Or again in Isaiah 33, Jerusalem there, the Lord will be our mighty one, and it will be a place of broad streams and rivers. See, this Isaiah saw this time when God would dwell in the midst of his people, and he would cause a river of abundant blessings to flow out into this world, into this city. And Ezekiel sees the river of life flowing out of God's presence in the Old Testament from the temple into the world. You see, we believe that, that we receive God's blessings because God dwells with us. He is a personal God who lives here in this place, who comes to us. He's not a distant God, but he is here concerned with our lives and with what's going on. See, in the Old Testament, God had promised to be present in a very specific place in in the temple itself. And then in John 1, we hear that, that God tabernacled among us. God entered into creation in the form of Jesus Christ and walked the city streets of this world. And then after he ascended, he sent down his spirit so that Jesus might dwell in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, dwell in our hearts now that God has ascended. You see, we, Jesus Christ is the temple. He is the stream. He is the doorway from which all this river of life flows. And yet, God, this holy and awesome and almighty God, doesn't just promise to be near to us, but to dwell in us. You see, reality is so much greater than anything we could hope or dream or expect to receive from God. That's, that's the blessing we get to have. And as we continue now knowing where the stream comes from, what happens to it? It, it grows. In a matter of miles, it grows from ankle deep, from a trickle to ankle deep, to a river too great to swim in, to cross. You know, what, is, what does that mean? What is this, what's happening? Well, as the stream flows out of the Holy of Holies, under the altar where the sacrifices were made, and pours itself down into a world that did not expect it, did not ask for it, could not desire it, didn't know about it, and, and often doesn't even want it. See, God pours his grace into this world, not because we deserve it, but because he is loving and kind and cares about us because of his divine love, because he seeks to pour his blessings out on us, not because he has to, but because he desires to, because he loves us, even though we are broken and sinful and fallen. God still desires to pour his grace and love and mercy into your life. You see, we can honor with the words of the Apostle John that we love because God has first loved us. We receive this love by faith. And it's not by our works or by our efforts or because we deserve it, but because God is so gracious and good and kind in sending it. You see, this, this stream that has nothing feeding into it rises. God's grace rises to this great insurmountable river. 
and be, let yourselves be drawn down in that river of God's grace. Let his grace la be lavished upon you. That is so much more than you could deserve or ask for, and yet is poured out on you. Let that transform your heart. Let it carry you to places you could not have gone on your own and to love in, in ways greater than you ever dreamed possible. Let God's river move you in unexpected ways. Well, now that we've seen where it comes from and how quickly it grows, where is the river going? And, and I have to be honest, this might be the most shocking part of this, this entire passage. And I know it's not entirely shocking to us because we don't really know Middle Eastern geography, especially not ancient Middle Eastern geography. There are a lot of countries and nations and, and things out there. But to the people of Israel, this would have been utterly shocking as the river flows out of the temple south and turns east. That means the river was turning towards the enemies of God, towards the nations that had set themselves up against God, that had attacked God's people, to nations like Edom that had been in conflict with Israel ever since Jacob and Esau, to nations that mocked God's people as they were taken out in exile. God's river of grace flows to these people who had not accepted him, who did not even care for his people or, or love him at all. And from there it flows in to the Arabah, the, the lowest place on the surface of the earth, a place of, of darkness, a place where nothing can grow, that is arid and dry and empty and desolate. And then from there it flows in to the Dead Sea, a place where no one, nothing can grow. It was, the Dead Sea was a symbol of God's judgment. You see, that was the plain where Sodom and Gomorrah had existed, where God's wrath had been poured out on the nations for their sinfulness. And yet, here in this vision, God's grace is poured out even there and, and transforms it back to life. God's grace goes into the, the deepest, the darkest, the most broken places of this world. And as I reflected on this, I came across an article a couple weeks ago that, that really just hit me. See, there was a man in, in ISIS who, by his own admission, had enjoyed killing Christians. And then he had a dream, a vision of a man in white who said, you are killing my people. And now he wants to follow Jesus. I mean, you can't help, first of all, but notice the parallels between this man and the Apostle Paul is on the Damascus Road seeing the vision from God and being, having his heart changed. But that's not really what struck me about this. It was, what struck me was a reminder that, that I think we all need to be reminded of every day, that no one is beyond redemption. No one. No one is too far gone. No one is too broken. No one is beyond salvation. No one is beyond God's love. See, as Ezekiel 33, 11 says, For I, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that they would turn and live. That is God's heart. And you see, as God's people, that's why we proclaim hope, salvation, and forgiveness. That's why we answer hatred with love. You see, as we... Let's see how this, how this river goes into the deepest, darkest places. We realize that God's love, God's grace can transform even the most broken, the most lost, the most callous, the most hard-hearted person and return him back to his kingdom, back to his fold. And so we as Christians reach out in grace and mercy and love. You know, having, having heard where the river comes from, how quickly it grows and where it's going, we're left with one question. What does it do when it gets there? What are its effects? See, this river pours out healing and restoration and life into the world. It, it pours itself down from the temple, from the mount, into the valleys below and into the desert. And it irrigates this dry, desolate land and changes it into a garden, a, a new Eden, a place where on its banks are trees that blossom every month, that bear fruit year by year and never fail with leaves that are for the healing of the nations. God's grace transforms lives and it flows into the Dead Sea, a place where no animal life, no plant life can be found and now it's bristling with life. Like the Great Barrier Reef in Australia where, where there is so much life to be found and, and it is amazing to, to just see the variety, the life that God can make come about. You know, as this river flows out, death is defeated, sickness is healed, life is given. And we as Christians know that this life flows out of the river of Jesus' pure side. On the cross, as the blood and water flowed out, that this, this river of life flowed out from a, a hill called Calvary on a dark Friday. And from there, after Pentecost, it flowed out into the four corners of the world through people just like you and me, people in God's church people who are God's church. 
And so we continue to share God's blessings and proclaim his grace to the four corners of the world as, as we go out as God's people. You see, this, this story, what it, what it really means, what does it mean for us and, and what is it trying to tell us? Well, it's a reminder that, that Jesus Christ is the true temple and he is the final temple. You know, in John 2.19, Jesus says, destroy this temple and in three days I will rebuild it. And we know he was prophesying about himself, about his body. And, and on that third day, on that Easter morning, he was resurrected. That temple was rebuilt. And now that true temple dwells in us. By his spirit, we now are the temple of God walking around the world into these dark places and dark communities. And we see another connection in, in John 19 as, as Jesus is pierced on the cross and the wa- blood and water flow out of his pierced side. You see, that's where that, that river bubbling up to eternal life spoken about in John 4 comes from. It's from his pure side that, that we are brought in by the Spirit, that we are brought into his kingdom, claimed as his children. That is our hope. You see, the punchline of this vision is that this river of, in this river of life, in the, the blood pouring out from Jesus' side, the true temple, is life and healing and restoration. You see, by there, by the tree of death, access is given to the tree of life. From that tree of death from which the crimson river flows, the cross, we are brought into God's kingdom. And in that river of life that flows in the true temple from Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and free. You see, we, the Dead Sea is a visible symbol that, that shows the, the sin and brokenness of humanity and no chemist can fix it, no chemist can make it right. And it's like ourselves in in our lives. We cannot heal ourselves, we cannot defeat death, we cannot save ourselves, but there is one who can. You see, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that through him we might become the righteousness of God. See, there there is only one solution to the brokenness of our lives. There is only one solution to the problem of death. There is only one solution that gives you healing and life. And it is in Jesus Christ alone, by his name, by the power of his spirit, we are given new life. And so as you go out and you hear this truth, realize that that God cares about all nations, all peoples. That Jesus died on the cross to forgive your sins and my sins, the sins of the whole world. That God truly desires that, that no one would die. And when you realize that, you can't help but, but realize that God's salvation is moving outward towards the furthest hearts, towards the darkest places of this world. And as this congregation that has been so blessed by God, that is, is such a blessing to this community in West Wichita, to Pratt and beyond, don't be afraid as, as God causes that river of life that flows from Jesus' pure side to well up as his grace rises and moves through you in unexpected places to unexpected people and in unexpected ways because you are a blessing and you have been claimed as God's children. You are part of his work. You see, you can either follow his river of life as it flows outward or you can get out of the way, but his kingdom is coming. His grace is moving and it cannot be stopped, it cannot be hindered, it cannot be broken. And it has claimed each and every one of you. May that truth give you peace. May that truth keep your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ, in that river of life, to life everlasting. Amen.